Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about strokes. So if you don't know a whole lot about strokes, today's a perfect day to listen and learn about that because unfortunately in the United States, stroke is huge. It is the second leading cause of death and it is the number one cause of disability in Americans. So to put it in perspective for you, roughly about every 40 seconds an American has a stroke and then even scarier than that, about every three minutes somebody dies from a stroke. So this is huge. We're talking about in a year's worth of time, Americans spend roughly about $60 billion in treatment and medicines and recovery from strokes. That's just mind blowing to me. Strokes are devastating and they can change people's lives forever. So I think today would be a good day to learn and kind of educate yourself on signs and symptoms of strokes, how we find out about strokes, and how do we treat them. So stay tuned. Let's learn some things about strokes. All right. So we've got the term stroke, also the same term as a cerebrovascular accident or a CVA. Depending on where you're at, you're going to hear both terms thrown around. Either way, both of these are broken down into three different categories. So we've got hemorrhagic, we've got ischemic, and we've got trans ischemic attacks. So all these are different types of strokes. So let's start on the left, hemorrhagic. Anybody that's heard the term hemorrhage, they know that that means a bleed. So hemorrhagic strokes are ruptured vessels that cause a bleed in the brain. So these are the smaller end of strokes. These only occur approximately 10% of all CVAs or strokes. Primary causes for this are going to be high blood pressure and aneurysms. So if you're not familiar with the aneurysm, that's where you've got this vessel here. We're going to make a vessel. It's going to have semi-thick walls and then it's going to have an area that's kind of thin and then it carries on, right? So over time, you've got blood flow coming through. Over time, this thin area, because it's weak, starts to bubble out here. And of course, you think about high blood pressure, that's more force pushing against here. So over time, it continues to bubble up, bubble up. This tissue isn't getting any thicker on the vessel, so eventually what's gonna happen is this pressure is pushing against here so hard Eventually, it's going to pop. And what's going to happen? There's where the term hemorrhagic comes in. So this is where you're going to get your bleeds from. So, like I said, only makes up for a small percentage, but they can be devastating. Even though they're less often, they're oftentimes more severe. So ischemic next is going to be a clot that has caused the vessel to be blocked in the brain. So this is primarily where most of your strokes happen. This is approximately what makes up for about 90% of all CVAs. And as you can see in the diagram here, here's your vessel and it's got a clot here that occludes this whole branch here. And that's gonna cause a lack of blood flow to the brain, which is gonna cause your stroke. So primary causes of this are gonna be atherosclerosis, that's always a tongue twister, um, meaning plaque buildup, um, AFib, hyperlipidemia, and high blood pressure also. And then finally, your TIA or trans ischemic attack. These are going to be coined many strokes by a lot of people. And the reason they say that is because they often resolve within a pretty short amount of time. Now, if you have a TIA, this is going to put you at high risk for having a CVA in the future. So approximately about one third will have a stroke in the future. And these symptoms that they're having are going to mimic an acute CVA just like either of the other two. So you can't really look at somebody and just say, oh, that's a TIA right off the bat. You got to treat them the same exact way. And then over a short period of time, you'll see their symptoms resolve. Oftentimes, these are little clots that travel through that are either dissolved or they continue to pass through after a certain amount of time. Now, causes for this, high blood pressure, smoking is a big one, um, carotid stenosis, which is where you've got your plaque buildup in your carotids, and uncontrolled diabetes also contribute to these. So as you can see, these are the whole three 
that make up stroke as a as a general word. So next is just going to be how do we differentiate the three of them as far as treatment wise and what do we do moving forward from there. Time is brain. This is huge when we're talking about strokes because what do we kind of primarily put forth as getting the patient better is how fast can we treat them. So the faster we can diagnose, the faster we can treat, the less damage we're going to have to that brain. And then, so in the end, that means the patient is going to have the less chance of a severe deficit in the long run. So 1.9 million neurons are lost every minute for a stroke that's left untreated. Now that, it just, that's crazy sounding to me. That is a lot of neurons for every minute. So you can see why the importance of time is just one of the top things that we need to worry about when it comes to strokes. So how do we kind of first off know that somebody's having a stroke? Well, we're going to look at their signs and symptoms. So facial drooping is a classic sign and symptom of strokes. So we're going to be looking for that one side of their face that looks as though it's dropped down or drooping to the side. Next, we've got hemiparalysis. So this is going to mean paralysis or weakness on one side of the body, the left or the right side. That's where we get the term hemi from. Next, numbness and tingling. Now this can be anywhere, extremities, face, left, right side. That is just a classic symptom. Next, we've got ataxia. So think about these terms and kind of put them in the back of your mind. Ataxia is uh, loss of coordination or muscle control. Next, we've got aphasia. And you see aphasia is broken down into three different categories that we've got. So aphasia is the patient's ability to speak or understand or express the human language. So the way we've got it here, I want you to think of aphasia as a connection to the brain issue. And we'll explain that a little bit further when we talk about dysarthria next, because they kind of go together. So when you think about aphasia, global aphasia is somebody that is in the most severe type of aphasia. These people, they have um, not necessarily inability, but they have a severe deficit to understand either spoken or written language and, and difficulty reading, speaking. They're just all around. They have a huge time with any of those and hardly make any sense most of the time when they're talking and they don't necessarily understand what you're saying or writing to them. So the next two, if you think about the words, it kind of makes sense. Expressive aphasia. So these are people that have a hard time expressing to you what they're trying to say. So you think about that as they are the people that have a hard time speaking the language and getting it right. Um, they may say words that are just completely inappropriate or not able to form sentences correctly. Mr. Stone, you think you're speaking normally, but your speech is impaired. He knows what he wants to say, but when he reaches for a word, he finds something else. I grapple average. Tans are glistening. He doesn't know that he's saying it wrong? It all sounds right to him. I want you to write your name, drop face. And then receptive aphasia are going to be people that have a hard time receiving information. They have a hard time reading or listening to somebody and understanding exactly what is being said. So those are all issues that are connectivity issues with the brain. And the reason I say that, dysarthria, this is where people can get jumbled up, is because this is also a problem with speech. So but not because it's a connectivity issue. This is more based on muscles of the face. So when they're trying to speak, the affected muscles of the face, the tongue, any of these are affecting the way that they're speaking. And that may slur their words or not allow them to say the words appropriately. 
So now they have a problem with language as well. But you notice it's not a, because their brain connectivity is not wrong, it's just, just a muscle weakness based. So slurring of speech would fall under dysarthria, and that's usually a pretty common symptom as well. Sudden or severe headaches. Oftentimes people that have these headaches say that it's the worst, worst headache they've ever had in their life, and it came on very quickly. Next, we have neglect. This is where somebody is now not recognizing maybe a side of their body. They don't even recognize when you say, you know, raise your left arm or look at your left arm. They don't even know that it's there anymore. So we call this neglect. Confusion and visual deficits kind of round off our classic signs and symptoms. So anytime you notice these, these are when you need to take action. Whether you're inside the hospital, outside of the hospital, doesn't matter. These are hallmark symptoms that we need to be aware of. That way we can act quickly. So while we're on the subject of signs and symptoms, I want to throw this up here because it's on our board. It's a great mnemonic for you and for you to be able to pass on to patients, family members, uh, being able to spot a stroke. It's be fast. Some of them leave off the B and it's just fast, but be fast is really good. B for balance, E for eyes, F is for face, A for arms, S for speech, and T for time. All these are really important cues on how to spot a stroke, and they're easy for people to remember. So pass it along. Now, when we get there, diagnostics. What's our kind of go-to diagnostics? First and foremost, everybody always needs to check a blood glucose because somebody that has a low blood sugar, they can mimic these symptoms to a T almost. So we need to make sure we're not overlooking the simplistic things. Next, we'd wanna perform an NIH, if that's what you perform at your facility. Um, this is a stroke scale that assesses how severe a stroke can be. Other people may use different scales. Um, EMS may use Cincinnati, it's a little more simple form, but I think for just our purposes, and NIH is um, what we'll kind of touch base with. That way it gives us a baseline for what the patient looks like from the start, and then it gives us something to go back and reassess later and see what our severity looks like. So CT scanner, this is important in getting images to first and foremost tell us whether the patient has a bleed or not, because that's going to alter our treatment plan um, as far as when we treat a stroke, because we don't want to give somebody that has a brain bleed a thrombolytic and make it worse and uh, potentially kill the patient. So CT scan is important. We've also got MRI shoved in there. So this gives us a little more detailed images and can kind of pinpoint more along the lines of where blockages are. Um, it's nice to go ahead and have coag studies that way we know what the patient's baseline looks like and that's going to be important for thrombolytics as well. Vital signs always important because strokes are um, tightly controlled when it comes to blood pressures um, and you know so we need that stuff as they come in the door. Uh, rhythm assessments it is nice to know if you have the opportunity to see you know, this might be somebody that's in AFib. They don't ever have AFib. And this is kind of a, hey, you know, we need to look at this a little bit more. This could be a cause of why we're here right now. So treatments are laid out separately here because you can't treat ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes the same way because obviously they're two different kinds of strokes. So in the blue, we've got ischemic strokes that are treated with either thrombolytics, meaning medications that are designed to break up clots, and we've got two highlighted here, TPA and TNK. Different facilities may use different stuff, so these are just two of the primary thrombolytics that we have that we see used today, um, and both work very similarly. They have different time frames, and the way they're given are different. But we're not going to touch on that because I don't want it to be confusing for people that use one or the other. This is usually a facility-driven 
um, timeline and guidance. So thrombectomy underneath is the procedure of going in and retrieving a clot. And this is usually done in interventional radiology. Hemorrhagic strokes. So treatment plan for that is going to be um, possibly a decompressive craniotomy to relieve some of that pressure from the bleed. Blood pressure support and control is going to be huge. You don't want somebody with a bleed that has a high blood pressure. It's only making the bleed worse. So we need a tight control on blood pressure to keep it down in a correct parameter. Um, and then you also have got hemostatic therapies. So that's going to be based on your coagulation studies and if there's something that needs to be addressed to assist with the bleeding itself from a medication standpoint, um, we could do that. Also, seizure management. Um, these patients that have these bleeds are at a much higher risk of having seizures. So we need to make sure that we're addressing them appropriately, and then that way we are controlling them the best that we can. Last on the list, you've got TCD. This is transcranial Doppler. Um, so this is something that's done a lot of times post-hemorrhagic stroke, and they may do this for a set amount of time. These also help detect problems as they arise post-stroke. Um, this may be facility dependent as well. All right, so real quick, let's talk about hemorrhagic conversion because this is one that pops up every now and then again, and it's confusing because it's a result of something that comes from an ischemic stroke. So your folks that have had an ischemic stroke and have had it resolved, sometimes after it resolves, you'll have hemorrhagic conversion or hemorrhagic transformation, whichever you like to call it. And these occur in about 10% of patients. Those rates are higher in patients that have received a thrombolytic treatment. And the result of those can go all the way from minor petechial bleeding all the way to a mass-producing hemorrhage. The mass-producing hemorrhage only occurs in about 3% of patients. But like I said, this can change depending on thrombolytic treatments. All right, guys, that's all we got for strokes today. I appreciate you coming out. I appreciate you learning with me. I hope you picked up a few things maybe you didn't know along the way. And as always, keep up the strong work, and I'll see you on the next video.